social media for just our church. Just our church. That's what it is. It's social media for just our church. So it's really, really cool. All right, so today I am going to teach a message called Hearing the Voice of Victory. Somebody say, Hearing the Voice of Victory. Okay. How many of you guys know the world can be a discouraging place? <laughs> Sometimes it feels like there's not a lot of good news happening out there. Just for fun, I just went to a local TV uh, news station for its top stories on Wednesdays. And this is what the six top stories were. Number one, video catches thieves breaking into cars at Sun Studio. Number two, Crosby's accuser stands by her story under cross-examination. Bill Crosby. U.S. intelligence chiefs declined to discuss Trump's contacts. Four, Islamic State claims stunning attack in the heart of Iran. Five, BPD needs help dying, identifying robbery subjects. Six, warrants issued for alleged serial con artists. <laughs> Are you kidding me? That's a lot of bad news, amen? Did you hear any good news in there? No, I mean, I know that there's probably some out there, but those were the top stories. And not only that, sometimes I always say all the time that, that um, life throws us curveballs. When I was playing uh, baseball, and I didn't play much baseball, I hated batting. One of the first times I ever got, to, got up to bat, my friend Mike Morocco, we grew in this, up in this city together, he had a nasty curveball and a fast pitch, and one of the first pitches he ever threw at me landed in the small of my back. So I was the guy that went up there and was trembling, you know, and, uh, and I would hate curveballs, and he had a great curveball. It would come right, and it would go around, and he'd strike, and it'd land in the right spot, right? Sometimes life throws us curveballs. It doesn't even hit the strike zone. In fact, it gets us right where it hurts the most, amen? But in the midst of all of that, I've got some good news. God has a reputation for leading people into victory. Amen. Say that with me. Say, God has a reputation for leading people into victory. A couple scriptures. This one you've heard me say a lot. 2 Corinthians 10, 14. Now thanks be to God who always leads us into triumph and victory. Some of my scriptures aren't here because the Lord gave them to me late last night. I apologize. Hopefully I'll be able to figure that out next week. Isaiah 41, 13. For I, the Lord your God, have your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not, I am the one who helps you. Isn't that good news? Um, how many of you guys know that even watching TV as a, as a Christian can be interesting? Uh, me and Amy, I'm not sure when it was, maybe a year ago, a couple years ago, we uh, were surfing through the channels and Back to the Future came up. You know, Back to the Future is a pretty cool movie. I remember watching it as a kid, you know. So we were watching it with the kids, and then all of a sudden one of the uh, characters swears. I thought, I never heard that before, you know. After hearing it a couple times, we had to turn the movie off because we didn't want our kids hearing this, the swearing, you know. And, and before we heard it with parents or with children's ears. Now we're hearing it with parents' ears. We had tuned in to a channel that we shouldn't have been watching and had to turn it off. When I was a kid, we started out with TVs that had, you went up to the TV and you turned the channel. And you guys remember that? And, and you always had like either a screwdriver or a wrench on top because the thing would break and you would have to turn the channel, right? Or you would have to, you had to literally get up and turn the volume up or turn the channel, right? But as stuff went on, they actually started developing remote controls, right? And my dad loved his remote control. And they were very picky about what we watched, which is great, you know? We were well protected. And I can't tell you, my dad and me, we do the same things over and over again, and I, and I just think it's comical. And he, he was the same way. He would put the remote next to him, right, on his right, he sat on the couch, okay? Something, if something went on the TV, he would be like, I can't find the remote. I can't find the remote. Where's the remote? Christine, get me the remote. Christine, where's the remote? It hits, it's right into the crack next to him. It happens every single time. And he's floundering around, you know? And everybody's running for the TV. Turn the channel, turn the channel, you know? Oh, man. I remember one time we were doing that. He's got the remote, and he was so upset that his hands were shaking. Turn the channel, turn the channel. And then we realized there were no batteries in the remote. See, as Christians, if you want to listen to the voice of victory, you've got to be tuning into the right channels. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's easy to start tuning our minds into the gossip channel. 
it's easy for us to start tuning our minds into the you're never going to walk in victory channel. It's easy to tune into channels that are not good when God wants us to tune into his voice of victory channel. Amen? And God wants us to tune into that. Somebody say, yeah. And it's easy for our minds to simply wander off. I to sometimes I just come in and I'm so unfocused. It's so hard for me just to focus. I had to tell Stu today, I'm having one of those days where I'm just hyper and I'm having trouble focusing. I came into the lobby and I was having three conversations with three different people all at the same time. I had to apologize. <laughs> I was trying to get a water for Connie, trying to get a key for somebody going up the stairs, give a key to the greeter, and get my message notes all at the same time. Stu has so much grace for me. I remember one time, he probably could tell the story better, but sometimes when I have meetings and stuff, Stu will drive so I can keep working. So I'll have my iPad or my iPhone, and I'll be working. And I was, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I was texting someone. I was on the phone with someone. I was, had directions in my earpiece at the same time that I was talking to this person about where we were going, right? So I'm doing all three of these things at once, and then, uh, and then I see the turn to the left, and all I said was, turn left. <laughs> Stu's like, bah! you know, he got left. Just trying to do too many things at the same time. Dan Edwards, I love you, Dan. You're on the radio. It's the same way. When we're doing double edge at night, we'll be doing something. I'll look over, and Dan has got two iPads, one on a stand here, one on the ground here. He's talking and playing two different video games at the same time. <laughs> you know? For us, that's restful. It feels good, but that's what he was doing. I'll take a picture and I'll throw it up on the website. It happens every week, just for fun. You'll see. Anyway, but we got to watch that our minds don't drift off into something that is not productive. Amen? Um, I love that story, and I'm not going to read the scripture. You can take a look at it, but love the story of Daniel in the lion's den. You know? In the ancient Middle East, um, there, um, this basically was a story of this empire rising and falling and being replaced by another one in 605 B.C. by the Babylonians who conquered Israel, taking a lot of the younger men into captivity into Babylon. One of those men was Daniel. When the lion's den event occurred, you won't believe this, but it's the truth, Daniel was eight, in his 80s. He was in his 80s. Through a life of hard work and obedience to God, he had risen through the political ranks as an administrator in this pagan kingdom. In fact, Daniel was so honest and hardworking that the other government officials became jealous of him. They could not find nothing to remove him from office. So they tried to use uh, Daniel's faith in God against him. They tricked King Darius into passing a decree that during a 30-year period, anyone who prayed to another god or man besides the king would be thrown in to the lion's den, and that's bad news. Daniel learned of this decree, but did not change his habit. Just as he had done all his life, he went home, knelt down, faced Jerusalem, and prayed to God. The wicked administrators caught him and told the king, Darius, who loved Daniel and tried to save him, but the, the decree could not be revoked. So at sundown, they threw Daniel into the lion's den. The king could not eat or sleep all night long, and at dawn he ran to the lion's den and asked Daniel if his God had protected him, and Daniel replied. In Daniel 6.22, he says, My God sent his angel and shut up the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you. This scripture says that, uh, and then the king was overjoyed. And Daniel was brought out unharmed. See, King Darius had, and then King Darius arrested the men who falsely accused Daniel. Now, Daniel didn't get all freaked out by this. He knew the voice of God. He had confidence in the voice of God. Daniel had his, had, held his head up high and refused to compromise. And that's why he didn't get scared. And that's why he didn't stop praying. He was bold. Daniel knew God was in him. He was listening to the voice of victory. Another story in Daniel chapter 3 is the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And um, these guys, now Daniel was older in his 80s, but these guys were young. Early 20s, late teens. And King Nebuchadnezzar set up a golden image in the plan of Dura and commanded that all his officials bow down. All who failed to do would be thrown into a blazing furnace. Certain officials informed the king three Jewish youths 
who was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and whom the king had appointed to a high office in Babylon, were refusing to worship the golden statue. The three were brought before Nebuchadnezzar, where they informed the king that their God would be with them. They didn't back down. Nebuchadnezzar commanded that they be thrown into the fiery furnace, heated seven times hotter than normal. But when the king looked, he saw four figures. Many scholars believe that one of those figures was Jesus, because there was only three of them, and walking uh, unharmed in the flames. Seeing this, Nebuchadnezzar brought his, the youths out of the flames and promoted them to a high office, decreeing that anyone who spoke against their God should be torn limb from limb. <laughs> These guys were young. These guys were youth, right? But they refused to, um, to compromise. They heard something. They knew the voice of God. They had their heads, up, their heads up high, and they refused to compromise. These guys were young. They were youth, inexperienced, but they knew something. They heard something. They knew the voice of God. See, guys, listen, life is going to come, and sometimes life is going to come hard. And that's when we need to be able to discern the voice of victory. Amen. A few years ago, I had massive heartburn. Like, I've never had heartburn like this before in my life. Two days of just, it got so bad, I couldn't eat, I couldn't drink, I couldn't even get up out of bed. I was so, and, and, and I know I should have gone to the ER, but I just was refusing to go, refusing to go, and finally, I got to go. So, I barely had enough strength to even get into the car, got out there, and one of the doctors there, and I know quite a few of the ER doctors because I'm there regularly visiting members or visiting people from our community center, and one of the doctors, who two of them were Christians, um, he said, he goes, I've got this amazing concoction for heartburn. And he says, it's a bunch of things that you put together. I'll have Rite Aid mix it all up for you, and you'll be good as new before you know it. Well, I went, and I got that concoction, and, little, and within three or four hours, I was back to normal. His prescription really worked well. In fact, the next day, I went back to the ER to visit somebody, and he was still on his shift. And he said, Pastor, you're looking a lot better. Now what can I do for you? I said, I'm here just visiting. <laughs> I have a, a, a concoction for you this morning, a prescription for you to help you hear the voice of the Lord. Are you ready? Number one, hear the word of God. Say that with me. Hear the word of God. God's word is the voice of victory in your life. What you hear affects what you believe. It's like gravity. If you jump, you're going down. Is there anybody here that can float at will? If you can, we'll cast the demon out of you and you'll be delivered and everything will be okay. But what goes up must come down. And in the spiritual realm and your relationship with God, what you hear affects what you believe. If you're going to keep hearing that you're not good enough, you will never believe that you're good enough. I'm not good enough to receive God's love. I'm not good enough to have his blessings in my life. My question to you is this. What does the Bible say? 1 Corinthians 5.21 says this. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. It's not your works that make you good enough to be loved. It's not your works that make you good enough to receive God's blessings. It's Christ's death and resurrection on the cross that qualify you to be his. To be loved by him, to be taken care of by him, to receive blessings by him. It's not about you. It's all about him. Amen? Genesis 1, actually, I'm going to go to Genesis 1, 26 through 28. And I want to tell you, God doesn't create junk. Amen? God doesn't create junk. The Bible says in Genesis 1, after he, uh, he created um, the light, he said what? It was good. After he created the ocean and the land, he said what? It was good. After he created the seeds, the trees, the fruit, he called it good. After he created day and night, he called it good. After he created the animals and the fish, he called it good. And in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, it says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over all the cattle, over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and every living thing that moves on the earth. And in Genesis 1.31, after he does all this creation, this is what he says. 
Then God saw everything. Everybody say everything. Everything, everything he created. God saw everything he made, and indeed, it was very good. God creates good things. You have a potential in Christ to do good things. Amen? It's all about Jesus. Somebody say, yeah. I remember I called my pastor a few years ago about a situation I was in. Um, I just found out the bad news that my dad, who had muscular dystrophy, could actually pass it on. All growing up, we always thought it was always the female that would pass on these genetic things that would manifest in muscular dystrophy. Some people were born with it. Some people, as they were older, it began to manifest in their lives. It was kind of a scary thing. One of uh, my dad's brother died very, very young because he was born with it. Um, we ha I had other family members, one family member in particular. He was, when he was in his early 20s, he was in the Navy. He was a really good-looking, strong guy, spoke clearly. And by the time he was in his late 20s, he could barely speak, barely walk. A scary thing. And we could never, f there was no way to detect it until a few years ago we found out that you could take, there's a, a test that could actually detect whether you have genetic tests, Yep, genetic test that would, Amy's great with details, that would see if I had it or not. Now, we knew that Miles had it because his dad had it, you know, and we knew what his numbers were like, but want to see if I had it. No, I'm not too worried about it because, honestly, I, I just believe that God does stuff, you know? And so, but as my daughters, you know, they're going to potentially pass this on and have children that could could, it could be really, really rough for them. So I called my pastor, and I was talking to him, and I was feeling, i am be honest with you, I was feeling fearful, insecure, nervous, because I was going to finally find out. And then he said something to me after I was done talking to him. He said, Jeff, you've been trained for this. Jeff, you know how to handle this. Jeff, you read the word. You know the word. doesn't matter what happens. You're going to walk in victory. And all of a sudden, this confidence came over me. Well, it's not like you do a genetic test like this, and then they let you know the next day. It was months. And finally, I got the phone call when I least expected it in the morning. And they said, Jeff, you don't have muscular dystrophy, and you'll never pass it on to your girls. And my response was this, grace. Grace. There's no other answer to it. It was scary. But you know what? God's voice of victory is there for you too. It doesn't matter what you go through. Good, bad, or somewhere in between. God uses everything, and he will eventually lead you into victory. Jesus conquered death. Someday we're going to jump out of these spacesuits, and we're going to be in heaven with people that have gone on before us, and death will be conquered. The final victory done. You will walk in victory. Somebody say, yeah. So, you got to be hearing. See, when my pastor began to speak to me, he began to, I began to hear what the Word of God said, and it got me going on the inside, and I got more confident. Hear the Word. If you want to walk in victory, you've got to make a habit of always hearing the Word. Be creative. You know, um, put it in your back in an index card. Put it up on your desktop, you know. Put it up on your mirrors. Put it up on the door when you come in. Put it up on the church chart. Put it everywhere. The Word of God to remind you that you walk in victory because you're God's child. Somebody say, yeah. Second, think the thoughts of God. So the first one was, hear the Word of God. The second is, think the thoughts of God. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. And this is where I want you to hit. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Amen? Now, let's just say, we think here, Candace, let's just say that you're at the bank, and there's a robber that's robbing the bank, okay? And so would, you probably call the police, that would be the wise thing to do. But let's just say that you've got a lot of faith. And so would you go up to the robber and say, Mr. Robber, would you please not do that? <laughs> Seriously, 
it's not right. No. You're going to, you're probably going to, probably let your man do it. <laughs> or you. You know, my wife, she's got a headlock. She can do all of that. But I mean, you know, grab that and say, listen, you're coming with me. You know what I'm saying? If a police officer came in, he's not going to be like, Mr. Robert, let's negotiate. No, he's going to stick him in handcuffs, tase him, do something, and they're going to take that dude captive, and that's what we have to do with our thoughts. Because if not, if we don't take our thoughts captive, our thoughts will take us captive. When I was very young, I was... Um, used to go to basketball camps, and this one year, um, I really wanted to get the MVP of the camp. I've been working really, really hard, but there are some really, really good players out there, and as they begin to give out trophies, I started to say things like this in my head. There's no way I'm getting it this year. I didn't work hard enough. Those guys are so much better than me. I'll have to try harder next time, and I was surprised when they said, that I got the MVP that year. I had convinced myself that I wasn't good enough. And that's not good. Somebody say, yeah. yeah. Amen. And not only that, can we just be honest here? Has anybody else here been offended by something someone said? Okay. You ready for this? Has anybody here ever been offended by something somebody didn't say, but you thought they said it in your head? And then you realize <laughs> that you wasted all that negative energy on something that wasn't even close to the truth. Somebody say, yeah. yeah. How many have been there? <laughs> all right. Our thoughts will convince us things that are not true for two reasons. The devil's a liar. Somebody say, the devil's a liar. Amen. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Amen. Some guys go up to Jesus. They're like, listen, man, we are Abraham's sons. And Jesus is like, listen, man, I could take, I could take these rocks. And they, and they would cry out. And, and they said, well, we're children of God. And he said, oh, man, you're children of the devil. Jesus, well, back up. What are you doing? You're picking a fight with the wrong people, you know? He says, you're of the devil because you do what your father does. The devil is a liar. He's always been a liar from the beginning, and there is no truth in him. Amen. So don't listen to that voice. Listen to the voice of victory. Somebody say, yeah. yeah. Amen. We can choose on where we set our minds. We can choose where we dwell. Amen? We need to dwell on God's thoughts. Here's a powerful scripture in Proverbs 23, 7. For as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Eat and drink, it says to you, but his heart is not with you. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. What are we thinking? That's what you are. Watch your thoughts. Somebody say, we got to watch our thoughts. I have a video that's coming up pretty soon, Val. And I think the audio is all set. But um, So the first thing was, and I'm almost done, um, hear the voice of God, think the thoughts of God, last, speak Oh, it's right here. I didn't realize it. It's right here. That is right here. Speak the promises of God. Amen? I want to show you a really quick video real quick here um, of this woman who sets her husband up to be pranked. Okay? And uh, you got the audio? Okay. Ready? This is a penny. I'll put this bottle of water right on top of the penny. Okay. And then I'll put this over it. Okay. And when I say the magic words, yeah. the penny's going to go inside the bottle. Really? Yes. Okay, let me see this happen. Okay. Now I got the towel. Boogie boogie. Boogity boogity. Boogity boogity. Boogity boogity. Okay. And you look down in there and the penny's inside the bottle. Oh! <laughs> That dude got set up. <laughs> that's, what, that's what the devil does. <laughs> He'll set you up. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But the good news is, 
that God will set you up for a good thing. Amen? The devil will set you up for a bad thing, but God sets you up for a good thing. So just like what Cassandra was saying, she's like, why do I'm feeling called to go to Bible school? It doesn't look like this is going to pay off at all in any way. And then later on, she finds out that she's not getting a two-year degree. She's getting a four-year degree because God knew what he was talking about. It was a setup. Amen? And I put on my Facebook last night something along the lines of, when the devil comes in and he says, put your hands up, it's a stick up. Don't believe him because God has set him up. Amen? God is setting you up for a victory. Anything that comes at you is a setup for victory. It's right around the corner. When things seem hard, it's a setup. Something good is coming right around the corner. When things seem good, it's a setup. God will use the things that enter our lives to, A, grow us up. And who wants to grow up? Amen? B, be blessed because he's our father and he wants to bless us. And C, be a blessing. Amen? So somebody says, I've been set up. I uh, was set up recently, too, for a good thing. And Pastor Dennis, like, he's not, he's just like me. He's not aware of time. We don't do time. (laughs) Stu, too. Drives Pastor Amy, Pastor Val, Pastor Linda. Nuts, because we're just, whatever. We'll have conversations. In our meetings, I mean, sometimes we have notes. I'm with Stu meeting. If it wasn't for my notes, just give us a few minutes. We'll be in the parking lot making a fire, having s'mores, and singing Kumbaya, my Lord. (laughs) You know, but, so anyway, I'm meeting with Pastor Dennis, and I'm noticing he's looking at his phone all the time. We have our normal meeting. And I thought, boy, you know, do you have something else going on? We could, it's all right. We can have the meeting go short. You know, no problem. Oh, no, it's fine, Pastor. It's good. It's all right. He keeps looking at his phone. I said, you sure you don't have to go? He goes, nope, it's good, you know. And then, and then finally I, it, um, he says, actually, you know what, can we stop the meeting now? We do have something that is important I have to go to. I'm like, all right. He says, all right, can you come down with me? I've got some. I'm thinking, what? Maybe we can have our meeting as we walk down the stairs. So we're walking down the stairs, and he's talking to me about stuff, and I walk into here to, surprise! Pastor Linda had gathered a bunch of people up from the community center and people that I knew for a setup of a birthday party. Pastor Dennis set me up. <laughs> Pastor Linda set me up. But it was a good setup because I love pizza. I didn't bring my lunch, and they had pop. It was great. That's the way God has. He's got, so this is the parable of Jeff. God's got pizza for you. God's got pop for you. You're being set up. It's kidding. But good eventually will come. If you keep trusting God, eventually you will land in his perfect will. There's no other way. If you trust God, you eventually will land in his per- perfect will. And somebody say, yeah. yeah. So speak the promises of God. Proverbs 18, 7 says, a fool's mouth is his ruin, his lips are a trap to his soul. James 3, 2 through 5 says, For we all stumble in many, many ways. <sighs> Just describe me. We stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. Whoa, back up. He said, if we don't stumble in word, we're perfect men. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn the whole body. Look also at the ships. Although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. Amen? If we would allow our mouths to be controlled by the word, we would be able to maneuver. Amen? So trouble's going to come. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to feel like an old sinner. The reality is Christ has made you a new creation. When you feel like you're going backwards, know that the Bible says the steps of a righteous person are ordered by the Lord. You may feel like you're going backwards when in reality you're being set up. You're going forward. So listen to the voice of victory in your life. Make sure you got the right channel playing in your head. God's voice of victory. Hear God's word. Think his thoughts. Speak his promises. Keep trusting God one step at a time, and eventually you'll land in his perfect will. Amen? Why don't you all stand up? I'm going to pray for you today. Amen. Pastor Linda, can you, or, you're not Pastor Linda. (laughs) Amen. Let's pray. Awesome, God. Lord, I I pray that, um, Lord, that you would help, um, us listen to your voice. 
Lord, there are times when we need to talk and just express our feelings, Lord. There are times when we need to just deal with things, Lord God, as they come. But in the midst of all of that, Lord, we know that your voice is in the middle of it, Father. So I pray, Lord, that you help us tune in to your voice of victory. Lord, I thank you, Father, that even now, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm praying with a bunch of people, family members that have so much potential. Lord, I thank you, Father God, that, Lord, I'm in the midst of dreamers. I'm in the midst of overcomers. I'm in the midst of a people that are going to walk in victory because I'm in the midst of the children of God. Lord, I pray right now against discouragement, against frustration. And I thank you and I praise you, Lord. We embrace your joy. We embrace your peace. We embrace your love. Father, we come before you this morning and we let all of our cares and concerns out before you and say we trust you. Lord, for all the questions that we don't know the answers to, for all the things that we just don't understand, we know, Father, that you have a bigger plan, a greater purpose, an amazing thing, that this is a setup. So I thank you, Father, for answers to prayer. Lord, I thank you that sometimes we can discern your word and we know exactly what you're speaking to us about. We can speak those things. But sometimes, Lord, things just don't work out the way we thought they should. But, Lord, you are the author and the finisher of our faith. And so I thank you and I praise you so much, Lord God, for taking things, Lord, that look hopeless and bringing them hope. Things that look dark and bringing them light. For breakthrough, for good things that come. Lord, I pray that you help us to continue to grow in you. I pray and I thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you want to pour out on us, Lord. And we pray that you help us to be a blessing to others. So today we come before you and we just want to say, Lord, we're going to listen to your voice of victory.